part number six of Disciplines of Disciples, and this is a message series focused on what disciples do. Now, granted, who we are as disciples, followers of Jesus, and sons and daughters of Christ is the most important thing, but out of who we are, that identity, it should stir up a desire on the inside of us and eventually cause us to live disciplined lives that honor the Lord. Every time that we do the disciplines, and there's many of them, we talked about fasting, we're in fellowship right now, there's, there's study of the word, there's celebration, there's rest, there's generosity, uh, all bunch of different things, and prayer and worship. When we live out the disciplines, it's not just a, it's not a method or a way of trying to get God to love us. He couldn't love you anymore if you tried or he tried. He loves you fully, completely as you are right now, sinful and all, which is all of us. But when we do the disciplines, it makes us and our lives more accurately reflect Jesus, and it shows the health and the stability and the truth of God on display in our lives. And so disciplines of disciples, we are continuing in this idea of fellowship, which is a discipline. It's not a suggestion or an add-on accessory. Fellowship, connecting with other believers regularly doing so. And we've been in this topic for a few weeks, and I got a few more to go with it, but this is actually the message I wanted to preach first. I just had to, I had to get a few more ducks in a row to, to make that happen, and so I've been looking forward to this for several weeks now. Proverbs chapter 27, if you'll turn there, almost all of the scriptures we're going to be reading are out of Proverbs chapter 27, starting with verse 17, for many a familiar portion of scripture, iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. The principle here is very straightforward in the world of, uh, in the Christian world, a, in, in the example here, brother to brother, but certainly sister to sister, that the interaction that we have with each other, it sharpens us. Think of a sword or a knife. It brings us to a more refined point. It changes who we are. We find in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, and other places that it's not good for man to be alone. Now, granted, that scripture was leading and pointing towards the creation of Eve, which was a helper suitable for Adam, and together they were helpmates, and they were married with each other. But I don't want the baseline concept of isolation to be lost if you're like, oh, I'm, I'm already married, so I'm good. Or, or, you know, I'm single. Does that mean that I'm incomplete? That's not what I'm saying. There's many single people in the, the history of the church that have done amazing things. They're called to singlehood, and they thrive in that. There's many of us that are called to be married, and God has blessed us with that. So this is not a married or single conversation. The truth is that it's not good for us to be alone. This is a connectedness versus isolation kind of conversation. Married or not, Christians are limiting themselves when they are isolated. Are you still a Christian? Yes. Do you still love God? Of course. But you, there's like an invisible cap on your life. Now, to be fair, it's kind of like I'm preaching to the choir, right? Room full of people. I mean, you're surrounded by people. Some of the loneliest people that I've ever met in my entire life are those that have an unbelievable amount of people that they know either on social media or that they interact with in their day-to-day -day lives at work, at church, at school, wherever it is. So it's not about how many people you surround yourself with, the kind of crowd and the, and the quantity of people. It's how many people iron coming in contact with iron is their real, authentic relationship that's taking place. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about, can I go from 900 to 1,000 followers on social? It's what are the real conversations and interactions that you have with people that are around you? Anytime that you think, or at least I think, about iron sharpens iron, my mind immediately goes to the craft of blacksmith, what a blacksmith would do, which was to shape and form metal and to create something new out of something uh, that's you know, existing, create something functional or beautiful out of something that wasn't before. I have here 
just two pieces um, from someone in our church that has been uh, building these, and they're, they're beautiful hooks that are going to be put up, and they've taken just a rod of cold, uh, cold rolled steel and just forming this into a beautiful hook here, and it's got a leaf pattern, and it, it's the creativity of God coming out of, this, uh, coming out of his creation. And so this idea of a blacksmith taking iron or metal and forming it together, my mind goes to many different places, but the first picture I get is always the anvil. The anvil is needed. See, what's important about this is when you have a piece of metal that you come at it with, you don't hold on to the metal and just do this. You put it, because it's usually red hot, but even more than that, this isn't going to do anything. You put it on an anvil and you hit it. Now, I'm not hitting it hard because my ears hurt when I do that, but you, you, you hit it on the anvil. The important thing about the anvil is obviously it has to be strong and it has to be sturdy because if it's weak, it's going to fall apart. But when you hit down on that metal, not only are you forming the top part of that metal, but because of the strength of the anvil, it is holding up and in many regards pushing back and you are actually technically hitting and forming both sides of that metal. The anvil is very important in the practice of metal work like this. And the anvil for us is the local church. The blacksmith is, is people, and, and I'm going to share who, where God is with all of this and all the different tools. But for us, the anvil is the platform for the metal work. The church is the platform for the primary work that God wants to do person to person. That's probably one of the reasons why the local church is pretty much always under attack. The more that there is real connectivity, the more that iron is hitting iron, and there is real sparks that are flying and real things that are taking place from inside and without, there's more attacks. Because you get rid of the platform, you get rid of the iron and the local church, then you have an ineffective iron sharpening iron scenario. The church is the solid platform for true transformation in all of its flaws and all of its issues. Again, it's, it's good to have other people in our lives. That's like the hammer hitting, a, hitting the metal and shaping the metal. We need that. That's what the vast majority of this message is. But the collective larger gathering is the safety, the platform, and the foundation for that experience to have the maximum amount of impact. Proverbs chapter 27, now verse 5 and 6, because there's actually several relational verses that we find in Proverbs 27. I want to kind of read through all of them. It's interacting, whether it be with a married person or a friend of friends, whatever it might be, even to an enemy, there's several points that in Proverbs chapter 7 that it makes regarding relationship. This is verse 5 and 6. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy, or many are the kisses of an enemy. What's being said here on the enemy side of things is if you are in relationship, let's say it's Christian brother to Christian brother, and you're in relationship, and you see that there is something that they're thinking, saying, or doing that is sinful, that is harming them or other people or their relationship with God, an enemy would look at that, and they wouldn't say anything. You know, for, for a variety of reasons, maybe they're embarrassed, maybe they're scared of losing the relationship or having that weird tension, uh, maybe they don't feel the relationship's good enough to have that conversation, regardless of what it is, maybe they legitimately don't care if that person gets hurt. A good reason or a bad reason, an enemy would look at a brother in trouble and they would multiply kisses. They, they would look at what they're doing and they'd be like, it's okay, hey, it's okay, God loves you, I love you, it's all good hey, don't worry about that. You deserve better than that situation. It's all, you're fine. Just keep doing what you're doing, right? No, no, it's cool. How you handled that situation was great, right? Kiss, 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 kiss. And, you, and, you're, and to be fair, we love those kind of friends in our lives. We're their heroes, right? They're always good champion us. Like, you're amazing. When I'm around those people, I'm like, man, I, this is great. I'm the greatest pastor leader in the world. I don't have BO. This is awesome, <laughs> Right? You, you, those enemies are going to be really easy to find because we think of enemies as someone that's coming against us, someone that's fighting and trying to destroy us. We don't think of an enemy as someone who's just willing to tell us good, sweet, beautiful, whole things. We think of who's trying to 
you know, physically destroy us or emotionally destroy us? What about the person who doesn't care enough, who is not bold enough, who's not confident enough in the word of God to actually come into your life and say, hey, actually, that right there is destroying you. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to shipwreck your marriage. It's going to ruin your finances. Your, your children are going to walk away from the Lord and hate you if you do that. What, where are the kind of friends like that? It says, again, open, better is an open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. An open rebuke. It's better to be openly challenged than to have someone multiply kisses. It's better to have wounds from a friend than it is for you to just keep running through life thinking that, that uh, everything you do is right and there's no issues and there's no deficiencies and there's no need for the grace of God to come in and refine your life. But the reality is God uses those hard impacts like a hammer to hot steel. God uses those hard impacts to form and shape us. And in those moments, we don't like the pain. We don't like the sparks flying. We don't like the fact that I was this shape and now you're making me this shape. We don't like that they're calling us out according to the word of God, that they're calling us to higher, uh, to higher character and to higher values and to higher living. We don't enjoy that. And so, so many Christians live their lives and the pursuit that they have is to get away from the anvil and get away from the hammer. Ooh, that doesn't feel good. Oh, whoa, whoa, that, you're not being a good friend. You're telling me that, I, that I'm sinning. You're telling me that I'm, I'm not following the Lord. You kind of like, you, you stay away from that. You, you, you run from those pressure moments, from those hard hit kind of moments. But like steel, I'm, I'm looking at this right here, which was formed, and I'm looking at all these other tools. If you look really close at them, there's marks, there's gashes, there's grooves that are in these things. Relationship to relationship, iron to iron, Christian to Christian, there's going to be wounds. And I'm, I think we've worked so hard to try to erase wounds and try to away, erase even the cause of wounds that we are living lives that are unformed and in many regards, not nearly as useful to God as we could be for the kingdom of God. We're running from it instead of saying, God, put me under the hammer, put me on the anvil, and shape me any way that you see fit. Now, I mean, there's a huge difference between doing that right and doing that wrong. I've gone to people before, and I've corrected them in really good ways. I met them there. I prayed with them. I cried with them. I like lived life with them and, and walked them through it and with a humble heart shared with them what needs to change in the right time in the right way. And I've done it wrong too, really wrong. Like I've come in uh, like the Kool-Aid man through the wall with the Bible in my hand and be like, Kool-Aid, the word of God said, and I just ruin everything. And I walk away like I just did something amazing and they're just left like you blew a hole through my wall, man. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> right? Like, I've, I've had it both ways. But for us, and I'm going to talk about how to do it right, at least a little bit of how to do it right. But for us, a true friend is one that is willing to cause some life-saving harm. I'll say it again. I am willing to harm somebody if it will save their life. A true friend is willing to cause some life-saving harm. So if you're in here and you have people in your sphere of influence in your life and you know that what they're doing is pulling them further from God and you're not saying something, again, the right way, we'll get to that. But if you're not saying something, then you're not willing to harm them in the moment to save their life for the long term. Someone that is confident in the word of God, that is strong in character and is sensitive to the Holy Spirit in other words, you've been developing yourself, you've been growing your walk with the Lord, is able to walk in under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and even if it doesn't go great, is able to harm for the sake of saving their lives. Some of you, you need, the, the whole point of this message for some of you is you need to stop kissing your friends, and you need to start harming them in the right kind of way, in a godly kind of way, because you don't really care for them if you're not willing to do that. You might be their preferred person. That might be the funnest relationship in your life, but it's not one that's forming them towards God. And that's not real friendship. That's not true. Iron sharpens iron. That's iron sitting next to iron and not really doing anything about it. 
On the flip side of that, some of you, that's all you do is harm people. All you do is just you come in and you, you throw down the law. And you don't consider where they're at. There's this quote. I, I don't know who the author is, but I heard it and I, and I appreciated it. It says, you can be careful and just shut up or candid and not really care. But to be a true friend takes being careful and candid while being willing to go through the hard heart work together. So some of you in here, you are careful and you are quiet. You're careful and you're just plain shut up. It's, it's I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to have that conversation with that friend, with my mom, with whoever. I, I'm, not, I'm not going there. So you shut up and you're careful and you keep your mouth shut. That's not good. You lead that person. You allow that person to go down a path of destruction in their life that has impact for them and everyone around them. But on the flip side, some of you, you are candid and you're not really careful. You just say what's on your mind. I know what the word says and I know what's right and I know what my testimony is and so bam, you drop the microphone and you walk away. You're candid, but you're not careful. A true friend is both careful and candid as they walk and go through the hard heart work together. That's what a true friend does. That takes a lot of time and energy. It takes a lot of prayer. It takes a humble heart to say, I have something of value I need to get to somebody, but I'm going to prayerfully seek the heart of the Lord to know how to do that in a life-giving way so that I can harm them in order to save their life, not kill them in the process of harming them. Some of you, I think God is, I think God is calling all of us in those, in those harming moments like a, like a surgeon with a sharp scalpel to, to cut out the infection or cut out the disease, and we're going in with a hacksaw because we're, we're not caring about them. We're just being candid. Continuing on that idea, Proverbs chapter 27, now verse 14. Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice rising early in the morning will be counted as cursing. So the fun side of this verse, the kind of surface level part of this verse is we have morning people. Curious how many of you are morning people? How many of you are not morning people? Well, obviously you're in second service, so that makes sense. All right, so like that, make, that makes total sense. All right, so, all right, so morning people and not morning people. This is what it's basically saying. Morning people, you wake up immediately, the sun is shining, birds are chirping, and just everything's wonderful. That's me, by the way, that's that's. I wake up, I'm like, let's go. To go to someone who is not a morning person, who is struggling to just survive life at that point, right? They're just stumbling out of bed at like 10 o'clock. There's slippers missing. They've got just bed head. They get goobers in their eyes. You know, they don't know where the coffee's at. They're just, they're struggling to even function. They're like, you know, just kind of walking through it. And you come up to him like, good morning, God bless you. Here's a scripture of encouragement. Woo! <laughs> well, this thing says here, you do that. You greet them with a loud voice in the morning. To them, it's as if you're cursing at them, <laughs> right? Don't be that guy. I'm that guy every single day at work, by the way. I, I read this verse and I was like, ooh. Because I'm a morning person and pretty much nobody on my staff are morning people. So I get to work, I'm like... Let's talk about the calendar, the tasks, the projects. Let's go. And they're all just not having it until like around 11 o'clock. And then they all wake up, right? And so that's the surface level of that verse, but let's dive deeper. I mean, that maybe, maybe that one person in here, that's what you needed to hear. Like, oh, that's why my wife doesn't respond well to me. You're like, that makes sense. You know, oh, I shouldn't be blasting the music in the morning when the rest of the house is struggling to just get up. Maybe that was the whole message was for you today. Praise God. But for the rest of us, going deeper in that, we need to humbly consider both the needs and the capacity of the people in our lives. The needs are pretty easy. We can look at someone's life, the fruit of their walk with God, and by and large, we can go, this is good uh, and of value, and this needs to change. This is what the word says. You need the word. We were just told, don't multiply kisses. We're told, go and be a faithful friend that causes life-saving harm and gives some wounds. So this is what they need. But a godly friend not only considers their needs, but also their capacity. 
And maybe there's a different or better word for that, but they can look at it, they can, if you will, read the room, and they can tell where the person's at. So kind of like the morning person versus the non-morning person, to be able to walk up to somebody and be able to feel and empathize with them and know where they're at, to take a pausing kind of moment and just sit with them. When you go up to them and say, good morning, how you doing? It's so great to see you at church. And they're like, oh, I'm, uh, I barely made it here. And honestly, things are really bad right now. Don't be like, sweet, see you later. <laughs> right? Like, Maybe take a moment, whatever your plan was to get, the good, to get the better seat in the sanctuary to go get your coffee, maybe stop and be like, oh man, I'm, I, I'm sorry to hear that. Can, do you want to talk? I can sit down with you. We can, we can have this moment together or let's get together this week. Can we, can we maybe get some coffee or, or just pray together or whatever the case may be? To be able to read what's going on, meet them at the point of their need and walk with them to their need. So you look at their capacity, and then you meet them there, and you move them together towards their, the things that they have need of according to Jesus Christ and his word. I can't tell you the amount of people that come up to me, good people, with good ideas usually, eh, uh, that come up to me, <laughs> and uh, they're like, this is what needs to change. Or right after the service gets done, like it's a good service, and the first someone comes up, did you know that that light was doing this, or did you know this was happening, or this needs to change? Have you ever considered that? And Honestly, maybe their idea is right. Maybe they're spot on. How about, hey, how are you doing? Or man, that was really good. I was really blessed by that. Just, you know, some common decency involved in there. You know, human to human, not, I'm not a robot. Like, let's, let's have some real conversations here. Let's, let's ease into a little bit. And that might be my example, and that might be my story, but some of you, you felt that. Someone comes up to you, and they, you can tell they don't really care about where you're at. They're just trying to communicate their message, right? They're just trying to, and I've done that to people. I'm just as guilty as anybody else. They just try to communicate, you know, this is what you need, so I'm going to give you what you need, and that's it. I'm going to drop the truth, and I'm going to walk away. Well, a real friend doesn't do that. A real friend meets people, loves them where they're at, hangs out with them a little bit, and then eventually says, let's get up and start moving towards what God has told us to do together according to his word. You may have heard this term before, a bowl in the china shop. And uh, obviously you can imagine that doesn't turn out well. <laughs> you know, like every bit of china usually ends up getting broken when there's a bowl in the china shop. And, and some people, they take great pride in how they approach people. I know, I know several people that are like type A, hardcore leaders, people of influence. When I talk, people jump, let's go, follow me. They take great pride in how they can walk in, discern a room, discern a people, and tell them exactly what they need to do and change. It doesn't matter what their feelings are. It doesn't matter what they're thinking. They needed to hear the truth. I told to them, and now I'm out. They take pride in that. They're a bull in the china shop. The problem is there's a bunch of people like me and others that are left trying to clean up the pieces and try to clean up the messes because that china is people's hearts and their lives. And you might think that you've done something good by just sharing what you had to share, getting it off your chest. You know, the truth is the truth and they're gonna have to just deal with it. You may feel like you're some hot shot leader, but the reality is a real leader is someone who is humble, is someone who is willing to cry the tears, take the time, and emotionally invest into the people that they're leading. If you, if you actually want to have real impact, then you have to be with the people that you're trying to lead. Amen. That's the way that works. And so you bowl in the china shop. Some of you that are business owners in this church, you need to hear this message. You may be completely right as a business owner, but you can be dead wrong in the way that you're communicating. You might have, we are great at building cases and PowerPoints and having all the facts. If we were to take someone to court on anything, we could probably win our court case. But God doesn't call us to keep a records of wrong suffered. He calls us as leaders to lead people. And to lead people, you have to know where they're at so you can get them to where they need to go. And some of you owners of businesses, you need to start acting and ministering more like Jesus Christ than just a regular old business owner who's trying to make money. Some of you husbands, 
out there that are heads of the household, you need to stop being a bull in the china shop of the lives of your children and of your spouse, and you need to be with them in prayer and in experience and in life and love them in the direction that you want them to move towards. And that goes for friends, that goes for wives, it goes for every person in here. If you have that mantle of, uh, you know, when I, when I speak, truth is received, then you carry that with wisdom, with humility, and with a caution in your heart as to not crush people under the truth of God. Carry it well. Be diligent in that, because I believe bull in a china shop approach, it is destructive, it is selfish, and it's ungodly. I tell people all the time, you can be right and dead wrong at the exact same time. We all, because in our minds, we want to know that we're accurate. I look at the timelines. I look at the details. I look at that chat. They said this. I said that. We did this. They did that. All that stuff is important. But do not forget or throw away the ministry hat that every single one of you carry. You can't throw that away just so that you can prove a point or so that you can be right in the court of your law. We are called to carry that mantle well. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from you, uh, from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And so in our lives, we need the anvil, which is the church, We need the hammer, which is the iron sharpens iron of fellowship from other believers. But if I just take this metal that's cold, that's hard, and I just bang away on this, I might make a little bit of progress, but I'm going to be hitting this thing until the sun goes down, and it's not going to do too much. But what I need to do is I need to put this metal into a forge. Got a video over right here, a forge, and they take many different forms and shapes, and they require different fuels and different methods, but but a forge heats up to very high temperatures so that you can put the metal in it, usually not just once, usually it's multiple different times. You put the metal in there until it is softened, it's glowing red, or or you can tell that it's soft, and then you take it to the anvil and with the hammer, and you begin to form and fashion it. Or in other words, when God says that I am going to put a new heart in you, not a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh, there is a work that only the Holy Spirit can do. And that's the softening of the heart from stone to flesh. We have the iron sharpens iron mantle and responsibility, but God has an important role because we'll just be banging metal against metal and getting nowhere. We need the Holy Spirit to soften their hearts and soften our hearts. I think oftentimes when it comes to relationships, We spend so much time trying to figure out what hammer we're going to use. Is it this end or is it that end? When am I going to do it? We're trying to figure out all the details. And what happens is the action of iron sharpens iron gets out ahead of our prayer life. You may have heard the saying, don't get out ahead of your skis or don't lean too far ahead of your skis. If you do that, you're going to fall down. You're going to end up in an accident if you're a skier. It's the same thing is true with my life. There's been a lot of times that I have spent so much time and energy writing that email and rewriting the email and then not sending it and then accidentally sending it and panicking. Like, you know, like going through the methods and the, the models of, okay, how do I communicate this? And what, is that offensive? Is that, a, and I spent all my time doing that. And by the time I actually communicate with that person, I spent very little time praying for that person. And I I don't want you to work so hard on the natural that you forget that the most important thing that must happen first and continually is the heat of the Holy Spirit, which caused the softening of people's hearts. So to be praying blessing over that person, be praying for that person's eyes to be open and for, for the truth of God to shine bright in their life, be doing that while you're considering how to minister to them, how to, how to share what needs to be shared. Don't forget the work of the Holy Spirit. When, when, a, when a blacksmith is pounding away the metal and all of a sudden the metal is not responding the way it's supposed to respond, it's, it, the, the hit isn't having the impact it's supposed to have, it's because the metal's cooling down and he needs to stop for a moment, not just keep going at it, it's gonna work. He needs to stop for a moment, take it, once again put it in the forge, take time, let it heat up, and then bring it back to the anvil and keep going. 
Some of us, we do need to take time. It doesn't have to be immediate. We need to take some time and ask and then let the Holy Spirit do his work. We can't forget that part. Otherwise, it's just a natural transaction between two human beings, iron sharpening iron. And so for us, that forge is not just for the other person, it's for us as well. God, I continually put myself in the forge of your presence. Continue, because people are telling you right now, whether you realize it or not, people are trying to form and fashion you, hopefully Christians, and you want to have a soft heart so when they do that, you can respond accordingly. Proverbs chapter uh, 11, verse 14. It says, where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. There's safety in the multitude of counselors. Think about counselors and what they do. You usually go in there, you share your piece, and they listen, but then they tell you what you need to do next. Well, the concept of that is great, but they're playing out of it. We don't like that as much. We don't like someone calling us to task or calling us out. We don't like someone pointing to us the things that need to be changed. We don't like that. In which I would say this, for many of you, when we're looking at the earnest counsel that God has called us to. In fact, let me read Proverbs chapter 27, verse 9. Oil and perfume makes the heart glad, and the sweetness of friends comes from an, his earnest counsel. That sweetness, that beautiful counsel that's earnest, that's heartfelt, that friendship means that the people you surround yourself with, they may not be the people you like to hang out with. They may not be the funnest people in your life. You know, some of us, we only want to have surrounding us people that make us laugh or people that make us feel good about ourselves or college buddies that we've just been friends with our entire lives. It's just great. That's wonderful. But you need wise counsel, earnest counsel in your life. And typically, that doesn't necessarily come from people that are the funnest in your life. Some of us, we need to get off the sugar high of just having best buds around, and we need to actually have some mentors, some leaders, and some accountability partners in our lives. There's a sweetness that comes from that. Friendships need to be built on more than just people that are fun to be around or that make you laugh or that go to the movies with you and you just enjoy hanging out with them. There is a priceless value that comes from the investment of stories and time and stories, time, and the advice that other people give you. You can learn from them. They can learn from you. It is a give and take. There is a blessing that comes both ways. And so for us to have a multitude of counselors is needed, not just one. I say it, I joke around about this. I probably should come up with a different saying. But I always say, don't ask your broke uncle advice for finances on how to do your finances. He's not going to give you good advice, right? So you look around, and I wish it was easy. I wish you could just look at all your beautiful semi-smiling faces, and look and see all of you, and I wish there was little bubbles over your head. So if I, like, if I needed somebody to, you know, that get, would give me good financial advice, I would just look through the room, and the person who's got the most wisdom, a little bubble would pop up, and boom, and there'd be a dollar sign over their head, and be like, you can talk to that person, all right? Or like, I need, I need relationship advice for me and my wife. Who's got the best marriage here? Boom. Oh, there we go. I'm going to talk to that person. It's not easy. There's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of times that you meet with friends and hang out with them and connect with them, and you realize this person has zero good advice. Why in the world am I hanging out with them, right? Like, it's a little bit of trial and error. I wish it was as easy as just raise your hand if you're the most mature person here because I want to be best friends with you. Like, I wish it was that way. It's not. But the multitude of counsel, you're never going to find somebody that has everything. They've got every single part of their lives together. They usually have at least one glaring thing that still needs some work and some process. There's a picture here of the different tools that are used that a blacksmith would use. And I don't know, besides like the hammer, I don't really know too much of the, um, I have some of the tools that are here. Uh, last service, I showed everybody this. Um, apparently these are tongs. I couldn't think of the name, so I called them blacksmith scissors. And, uh, <laughs> but whatever it is, whether it be blacksmith scissors, a hammer, uh, or other tools that are here, they all do something different. They have a different form and fashion, and they produce a different result. 
You don't always use a hammer for everything that you want to do if you're forming metal. Sometimes you have to grab things and twist them. Sometimes you have to make them smaller or bigger. There's different things that, that require different tools. And that's the same thing with the multitude of counsel. If you're a blacksmith and all you have is one thing, you're going to be really good at flattening things out. Like, that's, that's all the advice you can give. Like, I got great advice when it comes to how to run your business. I can tell you that all day long, all day long, all day long. Great. Have that person there that can speak into your life when it comes to running your business, or when it comes to being a good employee at somebody else's business. But you need to be well-rounded. You need to have other tools represented in your life that are having an impact on your life that people can challenge you about your emotional health or about your... your um, you know, the different facets of your life from raising your kids to the relationships that you have with, you know, in-laws or, or step-siblings or whoever and however in your life, there are different people with different tools, different wisdom and stories and uh, testimonies that they can share with you. This is why we need a multitude of counselors in our life. There is, says here there is safety. Other verses say there's wisdom in that. But I will say, please be selective as you invite a variety of different voices into your life. Be selective. I'm telling you, if you walk away from this going, oh, I need to double my friendship pool, you've missed the point of the message. It's not about how many friends you have. As I said before, some of the most lonely people are surrounded by people. Not everybody should have a voice into your life. Not everybody has earned it, not, and not every bit of their advice is godly. It might sound godly because it's like chicken noodle soup for the soul, and they read that scripture part of it off of Instagram, and so it sounds good. I can't tell you, when I'm, when I'm counseling with people or meeting with them, and especially when it comes to, um, to depression and or like divorce, I ask them oftentimes, well, what are the voices that you have in your life? Who's speaking into it? And a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, it's people who probably have the right heart and care about the person, but they have a jaded perspective about marriage or about how you should handle that, and they give bad advice. And so the counsel you're getting is not actually fully and safely built on the Word of God. It might just be cherry-picking from the Word of God or from their experiences. So please be selective in who you allow because the voices you allow into your life will greatly form and shape the direction of your life. The old saying goes, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. It's the same thing true when it comes to counsel. You, you tell me what's being shared with you and I can tell you exactly the direction your life is going to end up. Because that counsel changes who we are. So the question you can ask yourself is, who are you mentoring? That's a good one. You know, there's different, hard metal shapes softer metal. So who are you or who is mentoring you? Who is the, the hard metal in your life, the wiser person, the, the more mature believer in that area of your life? Who is shaping you? But also, who are you shaping? You may not be as hard as the person, you know, and as, as established as the person that is speaking into your life, but you still have a story that can speak into somebody else's life. And so for those of you that are like, listen, I got as many people as I need. I'm good. I don't need any el anybody else. I'm glad that you're good. But what about the people that need you? What about the people that are desperate to hear your voice and they don't even realize it? You know, my, my wife, she has many different people in her lives, but she's had a great friend since college. She's just the closest person to her. And I, I, I love that. I think that's incredible that she has that. And it's good that she has other people in her lives too because if it was only her and her friend, that would be beautiful between them, but it would be lacking and it would be limiting to Rachel and to our family. And so for all of us, maybe it's time to reevaluate. It's not just us four and no more, right? I mean, it's like some of you, you're like a, a mother hen that's just gathering up all your little babies and all your little chicks. Like, come here, get on my wing. I, I got my people. This is my crew. I got, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't need anybody else. I got everybody I need. I got me and my little, my little chicks here. We're good. Some of you, not everybody, but some of you, you need to let some chicks in your life. Not guy, but you know, <laughs> not that, but you know what I mean. All right, so some of you, you need to open up the wings a little bit and let some more people in so that you can bless them. Who's mentoring you? And who can you mentor? We should always have that in our lives. It refines us even as we mentor other people. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 10. 
uh, do not forsake your friend and your father's friend, and do not go to your brother's house in the day of calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. And so this is, I mean, the verse is technically talking about physical proximity, but the spiritual principle about that is emotional proximity, right? So like if your house were to burn down, chances are you're not going to run with your family in their PJs to your friend that's 20 minutes away. You're probably just going to go to your neighbors and be like, can, I, can we go inside, right? That's the physical proximity, but the spiritual and emotional proximity is when you are going through a difficult season in your life, you're going to run to the person that you're nearest. And so the time to open up and to share and to be transparent and authentic is not at the worst moment of your life. It's long before that. Because if it's at the worst moment of your life, yes, God can still be there and minister in and through that, but you're going to have to spend half the conversation, if not more, just bringing people up to speed. That's called dumping on them, where it's so much more healthy that you have that one, two, a few friends in your life, real, authentic friends that know your life, know your story, know your family, love your children, and, and love and understand the calling and gifting that's on your life so they appreciate who you are and what you're going through so that when you hit those low moments, they don't have to know, the, they don't have to relearn the entire backstory. They're right there and they know what you need and they can weep with you, they can rejoice with you, and they can run with you. We need to be like a neighbor that's close, not to everybody. There's a lot of wisdom and in, in, in not open your heart up to everybody. You're intimate with a few people, relationally intimate with a few people. Even Jesus was close with just a very few. He had the disciples and he had the crowds and he had the multitudes, but he was close with just three of them. And if you ask John, just one of them, because he's his favorite. So seems a little, seems a little jaded to me there, a little, a little slanted, but whatever, right? So Jesus was only close with a few people. You don't need to be transparent to everybody. You don't need to share your entire life story on Facebook or, you know, it doesn't need to be there for everybody because not everybody's going to care for and pastor your heart the way those close trusted friends would and are going, are going to. And so um, at times in those di difficult seasons, we need to press in deeper, which oftentimes requires deeper and high, or rather higher levels of investment. Sometimes people need to invest that into you. Sometimes you need to invest that into them. A lot of times we cut and run. We leave people half formed. I talked earlier about the tools and there's also these things called forms. There are also tools. They can, go in the, they can go in the anvil. You can put a piece of metal in there, and you can twist and move. In fact, we have a picture of this actual anvil that this blacksmith has been working on and forming different you know, artistic bends and twists. That's beautiful. But if you take a piece of metal and you start doing that, and halfway through, you just stop, chances are it's not going to be useful. It's not going to really look that pretty because it's not finished. And I think a lot of us, or at least some of us rather, we have left some of our people unfinished because of life. We either are too busy or we had too many people, we overcommitted, whatever happened. Maybe there was even offense, but some of us, we might need to go back to some friends, apologize, humble ourselves, and re-engage our hearts with them again so that we don't leave them on the anvil unformed, but we go back to the faithful work of being a friend with them. Partially formed is not good. There is a beautiful design that God has called every single one of us to. And the cool thing is, is other people get to be a part of that design process. Let's not leave artwork unfinished. Let's not leave metal on the anvil and walk away from it because it gets too difficult and too tough. This is why you shouldn't have 35 people that you're trying to keep at 100% relational level with. It doesn't work. You need a few people, not one, because it's really easy to manipulate one and to, you know, have that one person tell you that, you know, what you want to hear. That's why the multitude of counsel, there is safety in their wisdom. But multitude does not mean hundreds and thousands. It means get a few people that you can trust your life in, the, in their hands so they don't leave you partially unformed. I put it this way, a dull knife doesn't cease to be a knife. But it does, and it is less useful in the hands of a craftsman. I cut myself all the time with knives. I don't like knives just because of that very reason. But I found out uh, a few years ago that it's because my knives are dull. 
And so apparently, sharper knives, this is, con this is counterintuitive, sharper knives are actually safer. Who to thunk? So, um, yeah, because a dull knife you have to work harder at, and you can, you can lose your grip and you can slip on it, whereas a sharp knife, you know, it, it cuts through it like butter. And so actually here, uh, this blacksmith has been working on a knife. This knife is actually made out of a railroad spike. So really cool, like this, this right here is being formed into this. It's not quite done yet, but I saw it. I'm like, ooh, I want that. That's cool. I want to use that as my example, right? This knife, it's sharp, but it's not that sharp, right? It's still nice, though. I can cut with this a lot better than I can cut with this. If I had to cut a steak, I'm going to grab this, not this. This would take a while. This would be awkward, and that steak would look like, you know, hamburger by the time I'm done with it. This is at least going to get me through the steak, right? So for us... We are, as knives for God, we're still loved by God. We're still Christians, still on our way to heaven. We're still, we still have a purpose. We still can do good things and point people towards God. If we're dull, it's not like we've lost who we are, but we're not as useful in the hands of our craftsmen. And so, can you survive your Christian walk with few or no friends? Of course you can. Can you do that and, and, and still love Jesus? Absolutely. But are you going to have the impact that he desires and maybe hopefully you desire? You won't. You will be unformed, you will be dull, and you're going to make a mess of things. Whereas the more that you continue to allow yourself to be placed on the anvil, which is the church, under the hammer, which is the influence of other believers, the more that you do that, and continually come back because knives get dull. As they cut through things, they, they lose their sharpness if you continually allow yourself to come back to the place of refinement, you will become more useful for the kingdom of God. I didn't say more valuable. I said more useful, and there's a difference. You're already valuable. You're valuable because Jesus Christ paid the price for you with his own life. That's the price tag. You're valuable. You're the greatest knife set the world has ever seen. Chef Ramsay couldn't even afford how expensive a knife you are. You're amazing. You're valuable. But I want all of us to be useful in the kingdom. And there's a big price to be paid to be useful in the kingdom of God. And so let's make sure that we don't leave our friends partially finished, dull and unsharpened, and we don't allow our hearts to be there as well. A dull knife does not lose who it is, and it doesn't cease to be a knife, but it does, and it is significantly pulled back and limited in its effectiveness. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 16. A continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. To restrain her is to restrain the wind or to grasp oil in one, one's right hand. And all of the married men in here said... said nothing. Come on, guys. What is this, amateur hour? My goodness. First service, the only one that said amen was my dad. So, <laughs> and he got in trouble. People around him were calling him out. He was getting sharpened by people around him. Dude, don't say that. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> wow, I can't believe you guys said amen to that. All right, never mind. All right. Please tell me that the people that said amen were not the ones that were just on the Exo Marriage Conference. <laughs> that would be really bad. Anyway, all right, so I'm not going to get into the weeds of this one because we could be here for a while and I'll lose 50% of this church, all right? So I just, let's, hey, let's not go like whole, fully go there, but let me just point this out. A, drip, a continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. Now, obviously, I read that to be funny, but there is a truth in this that goes to all of us as we connect brother to brother, sister to sister in Christ. There's a truth in this. At some point, you're going to be rubbed the wrong way, and it's going to get difficult and annoying and frustrating. It's going to happen. I want to set the expectation in the bar real low right now, okay? It's going to happen. I don't know why we have this idea that because I'm in the church, it's going to be beautiful and kind and easy. Not at all. Think about this. Think of all the gatherings that aren't 
for Christians, concerts, events, you know, you, know, you, you have you know, things that you do at, at work and people go to the bar and hang out and you have all these different things you can do. Go to the beach, go camping, all wonderful things. Christians and non-Christians do them, right? Why do people love them so much? Well, there's a few reasons that I can't talk about right now, but one of the big reasons is because is you're just hanging out with like-minded people. And guess what happens in a like-minded scenario like that? No one challenges you. Would I rather go to a concert with a thousand people in it than sit in church on Sunday and have some guy on stage tell me what I'm doing wrong with my life? Absolutely. Church, Christians, fellowship, sometimes it stinks. It's frustrating. But it's because of what's being done. It's because we are coming together iron against iron. It's loud. I don't know if you've ever been in a, like a real blacksmith or a real iron work kind of place. It is loud. It's dirty. Oftentimes it feels messy, although the, the blacksmith I got this from, it was like the most organized thing I've ever seen in my life. But that's not how it normally is. Sometimes, oftentimes, probably all the time, church is going to be like that drip, 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 drip drip, but what it does is good. Notice in that scripture, it didn't say a continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome like wife are alike, so dump her to the side of the road and get someone better. It doesn't say that. <laughs> same, it's for the same reason why it doesn't say, hey, when church people get funky and weird, dump them for a better church or no church or no fellowship at all. It doesn't say that. Like later on, we're going to read, don't forsake the assembling of the brethren. Don't, don't, don't run from this. Don't remove yourself from the anvil, from the hammer, from the forge. Don't do that. Because what's done outside of the church might form you and fashion you a little bit. I mean, you run into people that drive you nuts. They drive crazy. They say things. They're rude. And it, it, you, know, you certainly get chipped away. You, have to, you get refined in that moment. Things can be difficult in that moment. You're going to, you're going to grow a little bit but you're supernaturally going to really grow in the presence of the Lord and with other Christians. They, that is how God designed you to be actually more, in a more complete way to be formed and to be fashioned under him. That continual dripping of the church and of other people that rubs you the wrong way, it's called the process, and the process is profitable. Don't give up. Don't grow weary. Don't run from it. Notice it didn't tell us what kind of iron sharpens iron. In other words, the good Christians, the ones that are acting wonderful, and the bad Christians, the ones that are just, oh, giving all of us a black eye and a, and a bad name. Iron sharpens iron, which means the person next to you that's amazing, they should be sharpening you. The person on the other side of you that's the worst, they're sharpening you too. Iron sharpens iron. And for <laughs> some of you are like, I'm not, not going to look, but it's this person right over here. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever. All right, so um, why else do you think we need the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit? He gave us many different gifts of the Holy Spirit and found in Galatians chapter 5, but we're going to need some patience, some kindness, some long-suffering, some faithfulness in there. Why? Because of you people and because of me. This is what Christians do. But God gives us the strength to be able to endure that, endure that the right way. That's why we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So I'm just trying to kind of give a reality check. Some of you, uh, you're just frustrated. And you don't know why things are so difficult. Maybe there's a legitimate reason that needs to be worked through and thought through. But by and large, even if that is all figured out, this Christian walk is going to be uphill at points, maybe for your entire life. But that's not an indication of something being wrong. It's an indication that you are under the influence of iron sharpens iron. You may not realize this, but through the hammering of steel, steel to steel, that on a microscopic level, steel gets harder. So I know it says iron sharpens iron, but really what happens in the sharpening, it's that the steel is getting, it's getting yes, it's getting pointed, but it's getting harder too. There's another way that they harden steel, and it's by tempering it and it's by putting it in water. It's like quenching it with water. And that's a process. We have a little video of it. They just take the hot steel, they put it in the water, and that sh I would think that would break it. In fact, if you put it in there too long, it will break. It'll become brittle. But if you do it the right way, 
And there's different reasons why you would do it and, and methods. You do it the right way, it will harden the steel. So whether it be metal to metal or with the quenching process, steel is hardened on a microscopic level. I'm sure the writers of, of this, when they wrote it, didn't know the microscopic part. They didn't have the technology and science to know that. But the truth still remains. Or in other words, on the outside, you're going to church now for years and you're just going through the process. On the outside, it seems like nothing's changing. But on the microscopic, microscopic heart level of things, God is transforming you from the inside out. And what I mean by hard is not a hard heart like I mentioned before where you're, you're cold to the things of God. What I'm saying hard is the things that are of value because it's not all about the bad things, right? The things that are of value, that you are doing that's godly, that's right, that's holy, that's beautiful in drawing people to Christ, those things can and should be hardened. Or in other words, they should be celebrated. They should be solidified. And they should be locked in stone. And so under the process of all of this, God strengthens us. Steel to steel, God strengthens us um, on a microscopic heart level which means that character that he's been building and forming and stretching and twisting and molding and, and moving around, that when it's where he wants it to be, that he can take parts of your character and he can, he can say, good job, well done, good and faithful servant. I end with this scripture, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. And let us, not, or let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We have to consider how to do this. We have to think about it. It's effort. It's not effortless. If you did it once, twice, you tried it five times, you went to that community group, you asked for that person to hang out with you and it didn't work, don't be lazy. Don't get distracted. Don't be defeated in that. We must consider, think about this. For some of you, we just don't have a value set for fellowship with other people outside of your immediate family. Some of you are like, I'm married, I've got my wife or my husband, I've got my kids, and this is all I can handle. And I understand there's seasons of life, but maybe, just maybe, what you need to do is fight hard to bring one more person in so you can have more balance and you can have more strength in that. For you extroverts out there, here's my challenge for you. Oftentimes, you collect people at the expense of authenticity. Because you're outgoing, you're fun, you like to hang out, you're the life of the party, you'll just, you'll know everybody. You'll connect and talk to everybody. Everyone's got your cell phone number. You have tons of friends on social. Everybody loves you and you love everybody. That's good. That's a gift. But if you're not mindful you'll end up collecting a lot of people thinking that you have fellowship and you don't. And it brings to you the, the expense of authenticity. You have a bunch of people and the reality is when you grab a lot of people like that, what you get them with is what you have to keep them with. So if you were the guy that paid for everyone to have a meal, guess what? That's probably how you're gonna have to keep them. If you have a funny personality, that's how you're gonna have to keep them. If you're the guy that always, you know, shows up and does something great, that's how you have to keep them. In other words, you can't run ragged with one side of your personality, one side of your gifting and of your generosity, and you can't really be authentic with them. My extroverts, be mindful of that. Be watchful that you're not just surrounding yourself with people, but you're being authentic with a few. For you introverts, I'm an introvert. Believe it or not, I am. I get my batteries charged by myself. Introverts are often, they avoid people at the expense of transparency. Whether it be because you've been hurt or you just don't like it or it's exhausting or you don't see the value in it or a myriad of other reasons, you avoid people, which means you're not transparent with people. You hide to yourself, just to your family, just to my, my little us four no more kind of thing. And that's who you are. And you think you're protecting yourself, but what you're doing is you're removing yourself from the anvil and from the hammer, and you are not allowing transparency both directions, bi-directionally, in your life. For all of us, we are going to have to fight to find, to keep, and mature genuine accountability. Some of you, you're fighting or maybe you've given up on the fight to find those people that will hold you accountable, that will mentor you, that you can be authentic and transparent with. Don't give up the fight. 
Don't relent. There's, it's a dangerous place to be isolated. If you need help, you need, call us as a church. I'm not saying that I have everybody, but you know what? I have no problem trying to play Matchmaker International and find you a friend. We'll work it out. We'll find it out. It'll be a little bit of trial and error, but we'll work through it because God wants connectedness. We have to fight to find those people, to keep them because life gets in the way, offenses get in the way, a whole bunch of stuff happens. You have to fight to keep those relationships and you have to fight to mature those relationships so that five years from now, you're not talking about only the same things that you talk about now, but God is actually calling both of you and all of you to higher levels of conversation, of intimacy, of pursuit of God. Again, you have to fight to find, to keep, and to mature genuine accountability. Lord, I thank you for every person that's here. Lord, there's still more to talk about with fellowship, and we will in the coming messages. But Lord, I ask that something in all of this challenges each person. You know where they're at. You know what their struggles are. You know what their fears are. Some of them right now, they can't even hear what the words I had to say because they're so hurt by the, the wounds that weren't meant to save lives, but the wounds that were meant to kill them. And they're walking around with open, festering wounds. Lord, would you, as you probably already have, but would you keep healing those wounds? Would you help their hearts to open up, even if it's slowly, to open up to other people? that they might find wisdom and safety in the multitude of counsel. God, as we grow together, may we have a higher and deeper value set for what it means to be in fellowship with Christian brothers and sisters in our lives, how beautiful and how sweet it is when we dwell together in unity, for it's in that environment that you command the blessing. God, I thank you for that. Lord, you have permission to mold and to shape us in any way and direction that you see fit. As painful as it might be, ultimately, God, you are our greatest friend. And you harm us seemingly on the outside so that you can save our hearts. And so we trust every swing of the hammer, every hop moment, every twisting and pot, prodding and pro poking, we trust you, Jesus. You are a good, creative, smart, powerful blacksmith that we trust. We thank you for this, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. One last thing I want to say, um, all of this, uh, I want to, we have several people that fiddle around with uh, black, being blacksmiths and working with metal in our church, so all of you guys are awesome, but I want to say a special thank you to Jeff Rathmall. I don't know if you're here. Jeff, are you, Jeff, are you here in the back somewhere? Um, here's a picture of him. Look how cool he looks. Uh, him and his wife are such a blessing, and uh, so he let us borrow all of this stuff and all these things he made. So thank you, Jeff. You're awesome. I appreciate it. God bless you. Prayer partners are up here if you need prayer for anything. Have a great day.